Welcome to the Modern Real Estate Investor Podcast, where we interview the biggest and most successful real estate entrepreneurs, investors, and capital raisers in the world to provide you with the tool sets, the mindsets, and the skill sets to help you conquer yourself, your life, your marriage, and use real estate as your wealth creation vehicle so that you can live a more successful, happy, and fulfilled life of growth and contribution. If what you're after is having it all, if what you desire is becoming the best version you can be across all areas, mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, sentimentally, and financially, you've come to the right place. We will bring to you the best of the best real estate entrepreneurs who will give you the insights, knowledge, experience, and skills so that you can go out and crush it financially and across all areas of your life. Grab pencil and paper, sit back, enjoy, and you are welcome to the Modern Real Estate Investor Podcast. Hello, Modern Kings. Welcome to another episode of the Modern Real Estate Investor Podcast, where we interview some of the best, most successful, and experienced real estate investors, capital racers, operators in the world to provide you with the tool sets, the mindsets, and the skill sets for you to conquer yourself, your life, your marriage, and use real estate as your wealth creation vehicle so that you can live a more successful, happy, and fulfilled life of growth and contribution. I'm super excited today. I have Gabriel Hamel. He's a real estate investor whose passion for real estate, the business, and financial freedom has helped him amass a multi-million dollar real estate portfolio of residential and commercial investment properties. His portfolio includes multifamily apartments, mixed use, commercial, uh, mobile home parks, and industrial properties as well. And from he, he came from humble beginnings and a strong desire for financial freedom. And uh, he set out to find a way to create that through real estate and using creative ways to start purchasing income producing investment properties. His focus is cash flow, um, and, uh, and, uh, and seller financing. So super excited to talk about those, those two things and even more today, Gabriel, thank you very much for being here, man. And you're welcome to the show. Yeah. Thanks Alex. Appreciate, appreciate you having me on and thanks for the introduction. So man, the first thing that I do with my guests is I ask them to walk us through their real estate investing journey <laughs> in 75 seconds or less. So get, go ahead and get started yeah. when, when you feel like it. Yeah, yeah, it's a long story, so I'll do my best to keep it 75 seconds or less. So, you know, the short story is I, I was the kid in school that, uh, you know, had a hard time focusing in the classroom. I didn't really know how what they were teaching me related to the real world. Um, and I think it was really the social aspect of school and uh, high school wrestling that, like, kept me kept me in high school. Um, and then I had joined the military my senior year of high school. I joined the Army National Guard when I was 17. I was doing the one week in a month thing, and then I graduated in 2000. Um, after graduating, just took a bunch of odd men jobs, really didn't know what I was going to do. And then, uh, 2002, I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, uh, you know, and that book really changed the direction of my life. It, you know, for, for, I'm sure most of your listeners, it's not a how to book, but it's really, uh, the mindset around kind of a mind shift around money and finances. And for me, it answered a lot of questions that I didn't even know that I had questions about. Uh, you know, I read that book and, and it was just like this this makes sense. And I was dead set in my mind that I would be financially free and that real estate would be, would be that path to, to getting there. Uh, shortly after that, you know, 2003, I get deployed to the Middle East. I spent uh, a year in Iraq and Kuwait. Um, and so, yeah, I went from living in my friend's attic for hundred dollars a month uh, before I got deployed to telling everybody that I was with over there, I'm going to come back. I'm going to build this real estate empire. And, you know, most of my friends overseas were like, you're an idiot, man. You're living in a friend's attic for hundred dollars a month. How are you going to come back and, you know, build this real estate empire? And I said, I have no idea how, but people do it. There's another, there's another way to live besides get a job and, and work till you're really old and retire when you're too old to enjoy life. And so uh, it started with that mindset of believing that I would be financially free and that real estate would be, would be that path. Uh, bought my first home in 05, another one in 06, another one in 07. And then uh, 2008, banking guidelines had changed. And in 2009, uh, really started focusing on, uh, seller financing and 09 through 13 uh, is when I put together uh, it was all no money down seller finance deals and that was really you know 2009 forward is really when I got serious about um, investing in real estate using creative strategies to uh, to finance those properties with the focus being cash flow first. Hmm, great man. Um, really enjoyed that. Really enjoyed that that you know that whole overview. It was great. And you know just like you man, um, the people who, that listen to this podcast are real estate investors some of them are active some of them are passive a lot of them don't know yet right but all of them have taken a choice just like you just like the choice the choice you took in 2002 after reading rich dad poor dad 
Every single person who listens to this podcast has chosen to use real estate as their wealth creation vehicle, right? Um, so, you, like, you, you read Rich Dad Poor, Poor Dad in 2002. That changed your mindset. Um, and then you took the decision to use real estate. But I'm, I'm curious about something, man. When you were in school, you mentioned how, like, you just couldn't focus and you didn't understand how everything that you were being taught was going to help you in the real world. Like uh, how, how, how young did you have those thoughts, those thoughts? Yeah, it's interesting. It's a good question. I've been asked before, you know, I think, uh, I think it really wasn't until high school. I mean, I kind of, I always had that entrepreneurial spirit, right? I mean, in, in middle school, I was selling candy bars out of my locker In high school, I was selling condoms out of my locker. I, I kind of had that, that early hustle. I had a paper out from 12 to 16, you know? And so I was willing to, I was willing to put in the work back then. I was, I, you know, but I didn't really know. I was attracted to business and that entrepreneurial kind of mindset, but I didn't know what that was going to manifest into. I thought, I thought business looked like I was going to be in a suit in a tall building somewhere, which is super unattractive to me. You'll never see me in a suit. Um, you know, and so it's just, I, I didn't know. It was just kind of part of the journey. I just felt like, what, what is the point of that? I spent so many hours in school just thinking, how does this relate? This makes sense that I want to go, you know, out in the work world and, and go work for someone else the rest of my life or get really, uh, you know, a, a very specific skill set. But the idea of graduating high school and then going to college and going to more school and then more school and then more school mm -hmm. and then a job working for someone else and making them wealthy was super unattractive. And then yeah. the other of that too early on, you know, having joined the military, I learned real quick, I didn't like people telling me what to do. And so a lot of the financial freedom journey for me really turned into a time freedom journey. It really, the, what, what I realized is one of the biggest reasons and motivating factor to be financially free is because I wanted to hold my time. I wanted to do whatever I wanted to do without having a boss, without having to show up, uh, you know, to work for someone else. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a great, especially the, the time freedom thing. It's uh, super important that I'm also after. Um, well, I'm after freedom, right? And I talk about all of these different types of freedoms. Um, but yeah, man, you know, you know what, what this makes me think of? It makes me think of a, a, a quote. I don't know if it's a quote, but um, what's the name of this big oil guy from like the 70s? Rockefeller, Rockefeller, right? Rockefeller. So sure. he was the one who like... Um, he wasn't he wasn't from the 70s but he was the one who like um created the, the the schooling system and he said right like like someone asked what should we teach them five days per week eight hours a day like what, what, what should we teach these kids right for like 10 years and then he said 12 years and then he said teach them everything about nothing right yeah that's crazy right so um yeah man do you have anything to say Hello, modern kings and queens. I'm sorry for the interruption. I know you're enjoying the episode, but I have something super important that you must listen to. If you've been following this podcast for a while now, it's because of one of two reasons. Number one, you aspire to have it all, to unlock your potential across all areas of your life and achieve true freedom physically, emotionally, spiritually, sentimentally, and of course, financially. And or number two, you're a real estate investor or an aspiring real estate investor who has chosen to use real estate as your wealth creation vehicle to achieve financial freedom. My mission as part of the Modern Kings and Queens movement is to help as many people as I can achieve financial freedom using the vehicle of real estate. And I believe that networking can be an incredibly powerful tool to help you unlock your potential across all areas, but more importantly, financially, and more specifically in real estate. I believe that in real estate, your net worth is your network. This is why I created the four step capital raising networking system to help real estate investors propel their growth by using a reliable system that will consistently help them connect with their ideal investors, build trust, add value, get their investors to promote them and put them in front of more investors and raise more capital faster and in a much more effortless way so that they can become successful, not only financially, but across all areas of their life. If this is something that you want, and this is something that you're interested in, Click the link below to gain access to a training that will explain the four steps to building a high leverage network that you can use to raise millions of dollars in capital, propel your growth in real estate, and achieve financial freedom in a much more effortless way so that you can have more time and energy to pour into every single other area of your life so that you can become successful, not only financially, but across all areas of your life. In this training, you will learn four things. Number one, aligned connections. 
I'll show you how to network effectively and how to make sure that your networking efforts work by leveraging a secret little known concept called the cloak track. Number two, networking tool. I'm gonna reveal to you a secret networking tool that the top 5% of successful real estate investors use to become successful. And I'm gonna show you how you can use it too to become successful and get out of that 95% of real estate investors that don't really make it. Three, high status communication. In order for someone to invest in you, they have to feel like they know you, like you, and trust you. A lot of people can communicate, but very few can connect. High status communication will allow you to build trust and add value in a way that will make people feel like they know you, like you, and trust you for years in a time span of 30 minutes. And lastly, the fourth thing is the attention multiplication machine. The world doesn't run on OU anymore. It runs on attention. And this last thing, the attention multiplication machine, will show you how to get wealthy investors to promote you and put you in front of more wealthy investors so that you can raise more capital faster and in a much more effortless way. So if this is something that interests you, click the link below to go watch the training. Make sure you stay all the way to the end. If you, if you find value and you want to book a call to talk about how you can get this completely offhand system, completely done for you system, implement it for you in the next five days. So click the link below. I'll see you on the other side. And I hope you enjoyed the rest of your episode. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. No, I mean, that sounds about right. I mean, I think, I think for some people, it's a good fit. Like for some people, they, they learn that way. Right. I didn't, I, I got all the way through high school without ever reading a book. In fact, Rich Dad Poor Dad was the first book I ever read for the word cover to cover. And to the point that I actually thought I didn't like to learn, didn't like education. I just hadn't found a subject or a learning style that, that worked for me. Like now I, I, you know, I consume podcasts and audio books. I just learn in that type of way. And I'm learning about things and studying things that I want to grow in. Right. It's not, you know, so I'm, you know, early on, I'm reading books about, you know, finances, about real estate, you know, later it was more about, you know, personal development and, you know, uh, family and marriage. And so it's there, you know, there's so many ways to learn. I think the school, you know, teaches a, a one type of, uh, you know, way to learn. And so, you know, you find what works for you. And, uh, you know, for me that, that wasn't until I was in my early twenties. Yeah. And it's crazy, right? Like they, they teach a one size fits all in, in school. And then, um, you could be a genius at something, but yet in school, it makes you feel like you're stupid. Right. It's like, it's like another quote that I, that I just remembered, right? Like it, it makes fish think that they're stupid because they're, they're trying to make them climb a tree, but if they made them swim, Right, that would be the best. So, um, so you read your first book after high school, man? Like the the, the rich dad poor dad that that happened after high school? That was the first first book I read, word for word, cover to cover. Yeah. Me too. The the rich dad poor dad man. Um, nice. and then and then you went to the military. How come? Was was that your choice, or or was that like did, did yeah. that just happen? You know, I so I was seventeen. And I had a buddy who was like, "Hey, Army National Guard Infantry." He said one week in a month, two weeks a year, you know, just like the commercial. We uh, we were on the high school wrestling team together, um, and I thought, "Yeah, that sounds that sounds great. Go go play in the woods one week in a month." So I joined in '99 in uh, and did the one week in a month thing. And then several years later, uh, you know, I got a phone call, and five days later, I was I was deployed. And so you know, back then, you know, the big pitch was, "Hey, they they're going to pay for college, 90% tuition and GI Bill and all this." I mean, I, I didn't end up going to college. And so, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't end up taking advantage of that, of that benefit. But, you know, I, I think that having, having been in the military, having been on a, a deployment, you know, it did put things in perspective. It made me really analyze, you know, my own life and, and what's, what's important to me. And so mm. you know, when I came, when I came back from that deployment, you know, I knew that I didn't want to stay in the military. I finished out my time and, and got out in, in, in 05. But then that focus really did become, you know, how, how do I uh, acquire, acquire real estate? How do I start building, uh, building wealth through real estate? So that's, that really became my focus in those early, early years and just continued to, you know, to the present time. So, um, that book just impregnated your mind for like years, right? And, and, and you, it left you with the idea and with the commitment that you were going to use real estate as your vehicle to achieve time freedom. Yeah, it just, it just made more sense. Like to me, it was like, hey, the simplicity, like, buy assets, buy cash flowing assets to, you know, and, you know, I know I shared kind of the origin story, you know, quickly, but when I came back, you know, this was during the subprime and, and banks were giving out money to anybody. And so, 
I had no job, no income. And I went to a mortgage broker and they gave me a hundred percent finance loan. And I thought, I'm like, damn, this is easy. Back then it was called an 80, 20, where it was 80% loan from one bank, 20% from the other and hundred percent financing. Yeah. I rented out two of the bedrooms. Now they call that house hacking back then. It just made good financial sense. And then I went back to the bank in 2006, turned that house into a rental, moved into the new one. And so, you know, after these first three homes, I thought this is easy. Like this is easier than the books. Like I'm just, I just got to show up to the bank once a year and buy another house. 20 years, I'll have 20 homes. Uh, like, like too easy. Well, in 2008, lending guidelines had changed. And so when I went back to the bank in 2008, they said, you don't qualify for a loan. And I said, what do you mean I don't qualify? They said, well, you don't have a job. You don't have a down payment. You don't have, you know, really any kind of income. And I said, yeah, but I bought these other homes. And they're like, yeah, that'll probably never happen again. They were giving out loans to anyone, you know, anyone with a pulse. Um, and you actually need to qualify. So even though my credit was good, and even though I had never missed a payment, uh, you know, ever in my life, they said, you don't qualify. Lending guidelines are different now. You should probably go get a job, go start earning money. And I thought there has to be a different way. So I did, you know, in 2008, I took a bunch of odd and jobs, um, you know, help anything from like help wanted ads and on Craigslist, just, just did everything I could to kind of, uh, you know, to make ends meet. But the focus really was how do I, oh, I ended up in a, like a 30 hour a week minimum wage job. And a few months into that job, I thought, how do I replace this income? I have to start getting serious about my, my financial freedom goals. And because it was a low paying job, you know, the idea to replace that income seemed very obtainable. And so I made a goal for that year. I'm going to find a deal that will replace, replace that income. And so after looking for a year online, every, you know, every night, uh, 2009, put my first seller finance deal together. And that replaced the income from my job almost to the dollar. So at, at 27, technically I was financially free, um, you know, and I, I, I had a deal that replaced my income, but it was very, it, I was still poor as shit. It wasn't like, yeah. oh, I'm financial free and now I'm, I'm wealthy. I had those two duplexes, the seller finance deal. I had those three single family homes, but it was still like, now what? And so I just spent the next several years really focusing on putting seller finance deals together. Mm. I, I understood the difference of building wealth and making money. Had I even kept that low paying job, my cash flow would have been twice as much. But I, instead, I used that time to go put more deals together. And that's exactly what I did. 09 through 13 was just really focused on no money down seller finance deals. And the reason no money is because I just didn't have money to put down. So I had mm. to find sellers that were okay with, with no money down. And then really my focus was, is it cash flow positive? Worst case scenario, I'm cash flowing from day one. Worst case scenario, which it never happened, I would have, if I were to default, I would have just given the property back. Uh, but instead, I just kept acquiring properties that were poorly managed, under rented, and had tired landlords and just really kept that focus for those first several years. Mm, that's really interesting, man. So from 0, 09, from 09 to 13, your focus was seller financing deals, right? And you all, all no money down seller finance deals. You, um, you were able to to quit your job and uh, replace your income and, you know, achieve financial freedom. Cause you, you had all your, your meets, basic meets net needs met. Um, and now you were focusing on seller financing deals. So how did that first seller financing deals look like? And then if you, if you want, man, uh, I would love to hear about a couple more examples of a seller financing deal that you did during those years of 09 to 13. Could you, could you walk us through that? Yeah. So what I, what I found is, you know, I, first of all, I looked, I looked for a year and I analyzed deals for a year and I had conversations, you know, with, with tons of sellers and made offers on a ton, you know, tons of properties. But what I found during that time is most sellers were stuck in either price down payment, interest rate, or some other emotional aspect of the deal. And since I didn't have money to put down, I had to find sellers that weren't so stuck on the down payment or they didn't need the down payment. And I really just focused on building the relationship piece of it. You know, my focus was, you know, just building the relationship with the seller. And that just came really very naturally. I like people. I was really eager to, to learn. So I wasn't going in there with like, hey, here is what I want. Does it, you know, does this work for you? It was really just asking questions and asking more questions and really getting to learn what is it that sellers want. I never assumed that I, that I knew what sellers wanted. The more I asked questions, the more I learned about what sellers wanted. And then it was like, hey, does this align with, you know, what I'm looking for. So, you know, this particular seller wants, you know, 50% down. Well, I don't have 50%, you know, to, to put down. So I might have that conversation and, and you know, and uh, not be able to put the deal together, but it really exercised that muscle of having those conversations, asking the right questions, finding out what sellers want. 
And, and then again, what I, what I found is that sellers, not all sellers wanted the same thing. And so could I give the seller what they wanted? What was the most important part of the deal for you know, this particular seller? Could I give them a piece of what they want that's most important to them and still, and still make the deal work for me? And that's all it, it, it came down to was problem solving and, and just building a relationship with the seller so that they know you and they like you and they trust you to you know, carry the paper for, uh, for the deal. Yeah. That's super interesting, man. And, 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 um, there's a very important skill that you have to develop in order for, in order for you to be successful at seller financing, which is listening, right? Like listening for what the seller wants. So for example, um, I got a deal going on right now. Uh, it's just getting started, but there's a plot of land that is worth like $3 million, like huge plot of land in a very awesome part of the city, right? That like we could, we could like, uh, build something amazing there. Um, and and the, the the seller wants like three million dollars, right? And he's been selling the plot of land for like three years. He hasn't been able to to get the the amount of money that 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 he's asking for, right? So, um, and I don't have three million dollars either, right? So so like I called him, and what he wants is three million dollars. For some reason, he that's what he wants. He's wealthy. He thinks his plot of land is worth three million dollars. He doesn't want any less than that. He wants three million dollars. He's been asking for three. That's what he wants, right? But and I'm like, well, price. he's stuck on huh? price. He's stuck on yeah, the price. Exactly, right? And I'm like, all right, well, if that's what you want, well, then would you be open about looking at the possibility of um, doing a development project there that will be worth more than $3 million, right? After like selling it and, give, and giving back uh, giving back investors their money and everything. And then just, and then, and then, and then uh, getting your $3 million that way. And then she's like, oh, I've never thought about it. Yeah, I, I would be, I would be open to, to looking at it, right? So now, you know, with, with my expertise and, and with our team, we can go and, you know, the possibility is that we could go in there, use, he, he's going to be the owner of the, of the land and we're going to partner, right? We could build a, a development project that will be worth more than $3 million after we exit and, and after we, uh, you know, give the, the money back to, to the investors. And then he takes his $3 million and we take the rest and that could work, right? So that's the possibility, right? But um, that's just an example of how seller financing works. And like you gotta listen to what the seller wants because maybe you can give it to them, while also getting what you want. Yeah, I think I think it is a it's it's a win win. Like I have a great example. I, I share this example a lot because it illustrates a, a couple points. But there was uh, a commercial property with seven multifamily properties in an area that I had purchased a lot of uh, a lot of properties previously, and this this was a listed property and it was being marketed as a, de a developable land, and you know it was a decent amount of land and. Um, and it, there is some potential for future development. However, it, it never, it never sold. It never went pending. And I had personally known some people locally who had made strong cash offers. And so the listing expired and I'm thinking, you know, this thing was priced. Okay. I know people who made offers on it. None of them, they, they didn't even, they didn't even get, um, you know, counter offers back. This is really interesting. And so I went to the seller and I said, Hey, you know, I noticed this was on the market for a while. I had heard you got some pretty strong offers, uh, but it never sold. You know, how come? And he said, look, I'm a 75-year-old retired judge. He said, I have no family um, to pass this down to. He said, I don't want a lump sum of cash. He said, I really just want income without the headache of managing the property. So he's 75 years old. He had owned this property, a lot of other properties for many years and was just a tired landlord. And so what he said is, he goes, I want income for the next 15 years. And he said, when I pass away, or if I pass away during that time, I really want that payment to go to this nonprofit organization that's really important to me. And so um, in a 15-minute conversation, I found out what this guy needed, what he wanted. He wanted income for 15 years. And then that's the emotional piece that I talked to. I say, price down yeah. payment, trade, or that emotional piece. He wanted to make sure if he passed away during those 15 years, that that nonprofit organization was taken care of. And so that was really important to him. And so with a, during a 15 minute conversation, I found out what he wanted. He was actually flexible on price, down payment and interest rate because I gave him the piece that was important to him was income for the next 15 years. He set it up in a trust. The nonprofit is the beneficiary of that trust. So that's all on his end setting that up. So if he were to pass away tomorrow, those payments continue to go to the trust, which pays that nonprofit organization, which is who he wanted that income to be left to. So not only did every other potential buyer look at this from a transactional piece, like I'm going to make this cash offer. The guy didn't yeah. want, he didn't want to go 1031 exchange. He didn't want to go actively invest. He 
he wanted to kick back and get mailbox money and, and have that level of passivity without the headache of being a, a, a landlord. And so in 15 minutes, getting to know what he wanted, I could create an offer based on that. So not only did none of the other potential buyers know what he wanted, his own broker never really even asked him what he wanted. That's Marketed crazy. Thing and solicited cash offers of which he rejected all of them because that's not what he wanted. He wanted income. And so it's just, you know, it's asking those really simple questions and then asking yourself, can I give them that piece? Can I give them what's most important to them and still make the deal work for me? Sometimes the answer is no. And sometimes the answer is yes. Man, I think, I just think it's like crazy that like his broker, all of these different people who made offers didn't ask him what he wanted, right? Like well, it's and, crazy. I think, and, I, and I think some of that is, I mean, the reality is I mean, even most agents and brokers are not investors, right? And so they're yeah. really, they're really looking at it from a transactional. For the sale. Yeah. Yeah, for the sale. And I mean, there is obviously a transactional piece to real estate, but to me, that's, that's the easiest part. If you and me verbally agree on something, we, we agree on terms, we're having a conversation face to face, like that's the work, right? We're negotiating, we're talking back and forth. I'm finding out what's important to you, what you need. You're finding out what it is that I, that I need, you know, putting that on paper. That's the easy part. The transactional piece to that is, is the easy part, but how to get to the emotional piece or how to get to you know, finding out what a seller, uh, you know, or a buyer really wants. That's the human piece that I think a lot of people forget, you yeah. know, saying, here's what I want without having any regard or knowledge of what the seller want. Doesn't always, doesn't get very far typically. Yeah. So getting the other person to open up and, and share their emotional desires with you is what will make seller financing work. So did you get the deal, man? Did you get the, the this deal? Yeah. yeah I, I bought that quite, uh, yeah, many years ago. So cool. You know, still, so now, um, yeah. So you're giving the 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 man the, the, this this uh you know man um his income every single month right you own the property you like it's under your control maybe I don't know you've 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 done some some value added to the property you increased the cash flow you're giving his income and then you 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 have cash flow now right or or what is um how did that property resulted to be in you know for you yeah. It you know, the, the value add was, I, I don't do, I don't do any, uh, typically any big like construction type project, this particular deal, uh, the property was just under rented and poorly managed. And so mm. a lot of it was, you know, wait until tenants moved out, uh, the commercial piece, you know, it was getting a, a cleaner, better lease put in place with rent bumps longer. Uh, so the commercial piece was a big part of that. So, uh, a stronger, better lease on the commercial side. And then with the residential properties, with that with, with that particular uh, portfolio, he was waiting for the tenants to move out, and then you know having the property management just do some light cleanup and then maximize rent for the area. Cool, awesome. I mean, and it and it's just life changing, right? For like anyone listening out there, um, you were able to come in there, give this man what he wanted to change his life, make him feel secure, make him feel like his last desire on earth was going to be fulfilled. Um, and then you were able to get a property and, 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 you know, and make some cash flow with, by, by just literally, basically just listening to someone. Right. Yeah. That was a lot of it. Like hearing what, it, what was important. To that was the work. That was the work. So, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's really interesting, man. Um, have you, do you have any other interesting, just like the one you, that you've met, just like the two stories that you've mentioned, um, seller financing deals that, that you've been successful at just to, just so the audience can have another another example of it and so that they can yeah. really drill it down yeah i mean i mean i mean so many every every deal comes back to a conversation or or relationship so i mean another another example um you know going back to both so 2000 2000 like 10 you know so i'm still kind of getting rolling bought my first several uh, seller finance deals and there was uh, all these new like big new apartment buildings going i live in a college town um all these big, beautiful apartments were going up. And I was like, what is going on? Who is this? Who's developing this? And there was a, a local developer in town. And I had found out that like his name was basically on, on all these. He was, he was developing all these properties. And so I reached out to him and was just curious to his story. Like, who is this guy? He's building all these beautiful apartments. Who is he? What's his story? Um, and so he graciously invited me into his office and he just shared a story. He said, hey, I was going to law school in the 70s and started buying multifamily properties. And by 2010, there's a lot of incentives to develop. And, and so he calls himself an accidental developer. Basically, he bought multifamily properties in the 70s, held them to 2010. In 2010, there was incentives to develop. He started developing. 
So he kind of shared his story with me. I shared with him what I was doing. Hey, I'm buying these small multifamily properties at the time, um, you know, with seller financing. And, and we both were, you know, just kind of fascinated with what, what each other were doing. And we just kept in touch. It's not like we became, you know, best friends. It's not like we hung out every week, but we, we kept in touch. Um, and I would go into his office every once in a while and we'd just chat. Now, fast forward almost a decade later. So um, I started buying mobile home parks. So now 2019, I bought my first mobile home park. Um, and this gentleman reaches out to me and said, hey, uh, a, a buddy of mine is selling his single family home the next town over. Are you interested? And I said, I'm actually not looking at single family houses anymore. I'm really focused in the mobile home park space. And so I actually own 10 mobile home parks now. Um, but at the time, I just bought my first one in 2019. And I said, hey, I just bought my first mobile home park. That's really where my focus is. And he's like, that's interesting. I actually own a couple mobile home parks. And I said, oh, wow. And I said, would you, are you open to selling any of them? And he said, yeah, there's actually one I'm thinking about selling. And I said, are you open to carrying financing on it? And he said, yeah, I, I would. Um, and so, you know, I went into his office. I mean, he had shared all the financials with me. I went into his office. We ended up putting that deal, it ended up being a 2% down deal. It was 200% cash on cash, which means I made that money back in the first six months. I bought that for, I'm just going off memory here, uh, you know, bought that for 680 or 720. It appraised out uh, for 2.3, I think 2.3 million two years later. Um, so here's a guy that's a sophisticated investor. He owns thousands of class A type apartments, but his focus was not in the mobile home park space. Yeah. So even though he was a sophisticated investor, there was still the value add component that was poorly managed and under rented. And his focus wasn't in the mobile home park space. So I got a phenomenal deal. And the reason the terms were so great, we already had that relationship. He knew me, he liked me, he trusted me. He didn't, and he also had enough taxable income that year. So he didn't need a large down payment. And so, you know, it's, it's a great seller finance term, but more importantly, I met him almost a decade before I bought that deal. When yeah. I reached out to him, I went, mobile home parks were on my radar. I didn't reach out to him because I was trying to get, get anything from him or sell him anything or partner with him. I reached out to him because I just wanted to know who he was and what his story was. And a 10, almost 10 years later, that led to a phenomenal seller finance deal. One, because of the relationship. And two, because that just wasn't his area of expertise. That's not where he was focusing his time, energy, and money. And so it was, it was a win-win. And that, you know, that same guy has other mobile home parks that he's not selling yet, but he's told me multiple times, when I get ready to sell these, you'll be the first to know. Whether or not I'm buying mobile home parks at that, at that point, I don't know. But the fact is, I will be the first one that he, that he tells. And that's the position I want to be in. I want to be you know, top of mind when someone's thinking about selling a property. Mm, yeah, that's awesome. So in order for you to, in order for anyone, right, um, to make seller financing work, well, there, there, there's a couple of pieces to it, right? It's it's being top of mind by building the relationship and, and not in a transactional way, right? But but in a genuine way, um, asking questions so that you can get that emotional part that, you know, that humans have, their emotional desire, and so that you can dig into what is it that they really want. And then apart from those two things, man, what other things have you seen are crucial to make seller financing work? Yeah, I, I think I think at the end of the day, you have to be happy with the terms that you're putting in place, right? I, you know, when when I structure a seller finance deal, the it was really a focus on on cash flow first. So I base it on do the numbers work, and it doesn't matter if it's seller financing, private money, hard money, traditional financing for that matter. I don't, I do not bet on future rents, on future growth, on a future appreciation. Do I think rents will go up over time? Absolutely. Do I think that real estate values will go up over time? Sure. There's going to be dips, but over, over the life, you know, as long as you own the property, is it probably going to go up in value over time? Absolutely. But when I'm analyzing a deal, I'm looking at how is the property performing today? There could be upside. I just don't bank on that upside. So even if it's poorly managed, under rented, it's, does it work today? And I look at the last two, three years financials and say, based on the way the property has been performing, does it, does it work today? Because I've never seen a performa that doesn't look amazing because a performa is literally, here's how the property would perform if everything went perfectly yeah. and, nothing, and nothing went wrong. And so even though, you know, you may paint, there may be a, uh, you know, a pretty painted picture for you of here's a performa. Well, if, if rents are saying, you know, 1500 a unit on the performa, but the actuals are really a thousand dollars unit, based on the actuals. And that's, and that's really what I, what I look at. And then Got you know, it. All, the, all, all the other intricacies, like 
specifically with seller financing, you can pull a lot of levers. I mean, you can go interest only payments. You can do direct principal payments. I've asked sellers to do no payments for a year and, you know, they said no, but they gave me six months of no payments. Uh, so you can be, you know, you can be as flexible as you and a seller are willing to get. Hello, Modern Kings and Queens. At my company, Millionaire Network Automation, we believe in the power of networking. We believe that in real estate, your net worth is your network. This is why we help real estate investors raise capital by connecting them with their ideal investors and helping them build a massive network of their ideal investors in less than 30 days and with only four hours of work per week. If you're interested in this, click the link below in the description of this podcast to learn how you can propel your growth with a reliable system that will consistently help you connect with your ideal investors, build trust, add value, get your investors to promote you and put you in front of more of their investor friends and raise more capital faster and in a much more effortless way so that you can achieve your financial freedom and still have the time and the energy to pour into every single other area of your life. So go watch the training and you're going to have the opportunity to book a call to talk about how you can get this 100% done for you system implemented in the next five days. So thank you for watching and I'll see you later and enjoy the rest of the, this episode. Bye-bye. That's why it's called creative fi seller financing, right? There you go. Creative financing. Yeah. Um, so that's really awesome, man. So um, two things. So then you make sure that the properties perform well and cash flow now, not based yeah. on some idea in the future or whatever. Right. So now. Okay. So th those are the, the, the other two insights. Um, so there you go. For anyone out there looking to buy your first or next property using seller financing, um, you got to make sure that you build a relationship with the with the seller right, in a genuine way that you ask them questions that really reveal what is their true emotional desire, right? because then they'll tell you what they really want and you can fix a deal in which they get what you want and you get what you want and it's a win-win for everyone. Um, focus on deals that perform well in cash flow now. Awesome. Um, so man, so with Hamil Capital, what is it that you're focused on right now? Yeah, so I've, I've really shifted, you know, I, I, I don't actually raise capital at all. Um, you know, I don't syndicate, I don't syndicate deals. Uh, you know, I really, it, for me, I look at opportunities. And so, you know, I've shifted for, away from the small multifamily space. I was really focused in the mobile home park space. And as of late, my last couple of purchases have been large industrial complexes out of state. Um, and so I like the, that triple net, uh, triple net commercial space. That's, that's where my focus is right now. And then I just have some other, uh, you know, investments. I've done some lending, um, uh, you know, and you know, it's, it's just maximizing cash flow while, while continuing to build wealth. And some of that's just for me, the natural progression of, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily want to stick to one asset class. I think you can kick ass in any asset class. I mean, I know people that are killing it in single family, killing it multifamily, apartments, self-storage. I don't think one's better than the other. Uh, you know, you find what works for you. And, you know, I'll kind of, I'll kind of micro focus where it's, you know, when I was focused in the mobile home park space, I was only looking at mobile home parks. So in that time, I wasn't looking at anything else. And during that time is when I bought, you know, 10 mobile home parks because I was focused in the mobile home park space. So I kind of had to shut off, you know, uh, like I'm not looking at single family, not looking at small multifamily, not looking at apartments, mobile home parks. You know, I've kind of shifted away from that more into the, like I said, the large commercial. And so I'm looking you know, obviously a more large commercial triple net type stuff. So what have you seen? What, what, what strategy have you seen work for you? Have you uh, like having a, a, like a spread focus, focusing on different things at the same time, or just, you know, focusing on one thing at a time? What have you seen that works for you? I, I think, I think it can work differently for different people. So I do, I do kind of, like I said, micro focus where, um, you know, I, I'm not going to pigeon myself into, you know, Oh, I'm open. Only buy mobile home parks for the rest of my life. I'm going to be the mobile home park expert, and for you know the end of time, that's the only thing I'm looking at and buying. So, but when I was focused on buying mobile home parks, I really wasn't looking at anything, anything else. else. Got it. And so it's you know I will focus when when I was buying those seller finance deal. I was there was a neighborhood. It's called the Whitaker, and I was buying small multifamily in the Whitaker. So I told everybody, and I looked at properties that I'm buying small multifamily in the Whitaker. So that was kind of that micro focus at the time, small multifamily in the Whitaker. When I put that out in the world, hey, small multifamily in the Whitaker, when I was having conversation, small multifamily in the Whitaker, what did I end up buying? I ended up buying a bunch of small multifamily in the Whitaker. When I shifted into the mobile home park space and I'm telling people, you know, hey, uh, I'm buying, I want to buy, you know, value add mobile home parks. 
Well, I kept telling a broker that that does mostly apartments that when they got in-house listing of a mobile home park, they called me. You know, when that when that deal I told just just mentioned, when that guy said, Hey, my buddy's selling that single family home, I had to say, Hey, I'm not looking at single family home, I'm focused on mobile home parks. Had I not said that, I would never have known that he was that he had mobile home parks and that he had one that he was looking to sell. And so it's I, I kind of focus within what I'm working on in in that period of time. Awesome. I, I I like that. I like that strategy. Um, so man, you have something going on on your on your Instagram, uh, Road to 100, right? You have a bunch of posts that say that. Uh, could you could you tell me a little bit more about what that is about? The the Road to 100 was just a podcast that I went on. That's my buddy's podcast. Oh, uh, okay, got yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, there, you know, it's the Road to 100 million. Um, is is their podcast Road to 100? Are you going on that road though? Yeah, I mean, my, you know, my, my portfolio is worth about 50 million right now, um, probably a little bit more. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm working towards, you know, building a hundred million dollar portfolio, uh, you know, but I'm also, it, it's important to do that in a way that doesn't, uh, you know, I'm not willing to sacrifice, you know, my time the, in, in the sense of uh, I will continue to put deals together because I love the journey. I love the process. I enjoy investing in real estate. Uh, but I'm not going to do it, you know, to sacrifice my time with my family, with my kids, with my wife, with my health. And so for me, I'm really, really clear on the couple of things that are important to me. And some of that came through reflection of when I was younger, I was so, I was so, um, you know, loud about like, I want to be rich. I want to be wealthy. I'm going to be rich. I'm going to be wealthy. Like, and I didn't really know. I was like, why, why is that important to me? I had to ask myself like, why is it that I want to be wealthy? Why mm -hmm. is that so in, like, like it's like an innate level, just like a guttural level. Like I just was like, I want to be financially free. I want to, I want to be wealthy. But with reflection, as I can think I mentioned kind of early, you know, early in the show, it was about time. I, I, it wasn't about, I didn't want to go swim in a pile of money. It wasn't about, Hey, look how successful I am. It was about, I want to own my time. I want the freedom to own my time. And then through that journey, the things that were important to me were my relationships with, with my family, with friends, like deep, meaningful relationships. I wanted, you know, my health is important to me. Being able to travel is important to me. And, and being able to, you know, time freedom to me could look different than time freedom to someone else. But like, I like to go work out in the middle of the day, right? And it's, yeah. it's, it's, because, I, it's because I can I don't want to squeeze in a 5 a.m. workout because I have to go rush off to work at, you know, 6.30 a.m. and drive to an office somewhere and work all day and then come home and give my family, you know, what's, what's left, left. When, yeah. when I'm exhausted, you know? And so to me, once I got clear, like I'm, I'm really clear on what's important to me. And so, you know, talking about that, you know, road to 100 or getting to a hundred million dollar portfolio, that it's going to happen. That's going to happen. I mean, it's just, it, 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 it will I'm not willing to sacrifice things like my freedom, my health, the time with my family, the ability to just literally live my life um, at, you know, at the death of me trying to reach that, reach that goal. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I say no to things that don't align with that goal. I say no to a lot and I say yes to things that do align with that goal. And so it's just being clear on what's important and having that on the forefront of my mind and asking that question. If I take this on, does it take me farther away from the things that are important to me or does it get me closer to the things that are important to me and and i think it's important when you know on this life journey i watch a lot of people get into real estate or the whole reason they say they get into real estate is financial freedom and you dig a little bit deeper and it's not about the money it's really about the time freedom they want to spend more time with their family or give back to a cause that's important to them they want to travel whatever it might be but the dangerous thing, and I've also watched a lot of people in the real estate world build businesses that actually take them farther away from that. So they left a W-2 job that they were working 40 hours a week. Now they started a business, they're working 80 hours a week, and they're 10 years into it, and they're going, holy shit, how do I get out? Yeah. Now I have less time with my family, less time for my health, less time to travel. And so I think it's, it's really important to be clear on why are you getting into real estate in the first place? And, and are you taking on things... You know, now, now you can, you can start a real estate brokerage, property management company. You can build all sorts of businesses around real estate. I've chosen not to, and I'm not saying one's right or, or wrong. You know, I have friends with successful, 
you know, large brokerages and, and, and they love doing that, or they start a property management company and they love doing that. That feels very heavy to me. I don't, I don't want that responsibility. I don't want that time suck. And so my focus has always been strictly on investments and making sure that the things I take on don't take so much time away from the things that are actually important to me. And, and that's, that's, the awesome. give, that's the advice I give to others is make sure that you're getting into things that align with what the whole reason you're getting into them in the first place. That was great, man. Um, you put all that beautiful, right? Um, just because you're living here, right? So, um, cause a lot of, a lot of men, right on their journey towards 100 or whatever, towards getting rich, they lose their health and then they have to use the money that they gain to get their, to get their, their, their health back. Right. And then on their journey to getting rich, they lose their family and then they use that money to pay for the divorce papers and all of that stuff. Um, right. That, that that's going on. And, and then, and then they get there, right. They, they, they become rich, but they're unhappy. So what's the point, right? Uh, exactly. If you didn't, if you didn't really get clear on what you wanted, so um, so man, so with with the time freedom that you have, how how do your days look like now? Yeah, you know, it it really depends. Like you know, the last couple of years we've gotten to go on a lot of amazing trips, um, and and see a lot of beautiful places, you know. But at the same time, like you know, right now, you know, it's I I also enjoy when we're home. You know, with it, it can be the little things, right? Like the ability that I'm, I'm able to drive my kids to school you know, every day and, yeah. take them off. and, and, you know, my youngest son has, you know, a, a soccer tournament this summer. Like, so, you know, we got to spend three days up at the soccer tournament. It's like, I, I'm, I like being around for those things. I want to be an active part in my family's life. So there's periods of time where we go and do, you know, we go do fun stuff and we're traveling, you know, when, when the world shut down, you know, especially here in Oregon, we jumped in an RV, first went to Maui, uh, Hawaii for a month. Then we came back and we jumped in an RV. We chose not to school the kids that year because it all went online and we're like, this is ridiculous. We jumped in an RV and traveled for two months with no plan. We hit eight cool. states. And so it was, it was the ability to do that. So there was the financial piece that allowed us to do that. But really what it was, was creating two months of memories. We jumped in an RV and we were just winging it. And so I love the fun, adventurous stuff, but I also enjoy being at home, just like just being present with, you know, with my family and, and, and with my friends locally here too. So I think that's equally as important. It's not always going, going, going. Great. Yeah, I've learned that, man. I've learned that. And it, it's because, I mean, you know, I used to you know wake up at 4 a.m. I had like a 30 minute thing to do this done and then a 30 minute thing to do another thing. And then I was just like going, 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 going. And then I, you know, I stopped to get clear and I'm like, well, where am I going? Right. Like, you know, where, where am I running to? And, you know, I, I got clear and I've started to, um, you know, to take it easy a little bit more to actually be present and enjoy the, the journey. Right. Because the goal is not really what I'm after. Right. Because when I get there, when I get to like $10 million or whatever, I'm just going to want to go for a hundred. And then when I get there, I'm just going to make the goal bigger. And then when I get, and then, that, and then that's going to keep on going. So I might as well just enjoy the, the journey because like you said, I'm going to get there. Right. Yeah. But, and I think a lot of, us are, I think a lot of us are like that starting off too. I mean, it's one thing that's really allowed me, uh, you know, it's not always like, I, I do think there's a, a piece of like growth, right? Like there's nothing wrong. You, you can, I guess what I'm trying to say is you can be grateful and have gratitude for where you are and content with where you're at. And at the same time, have big, massive goals. Right. Yeah. So I think it's easy to kind of look at that gap sometime of being like, oh man, I need to get here. But what about looking back and be like, wow, I, I've also gotten to here. I'm grateful yeah. where I'm at today. Yes, I want to go kill it in all these areas of life. And there's nothing wrong with that. But you could also be content and grateful where you're at today. And for me, gratitude is my is the biggest contributor to my happiness, like hands down. Yeah. Just your perspective, right? Controlling your perspective because you could you could be miserable right now, right? If you didn't have the, the that perspective or that gratitude in your heart. But no, like you, 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 you've been able to choose what perspective you want to have and be grateful for where you are, for where you are. Um, so yeah, I call that gratitude and contempt without complacency. There you go. Love yeah. it. 100%. So man, we have a couple of minutes left to the podcast. I've really enjoyed it, um, you know, till now. And I, I like to finish my podcast with a couple of questions. The first one is, um, if you could travel back in time all the way to the time in, you know, in 2002, when you read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. What are some of the things that you would do differently to get, I don't know, further or 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 to or, or to to get your time freedom 
faster or to get your family to be better and your health, whatever, right? Just to, to um, I mean, you're g- good, right? But I, I would, I think what I'm trying to say, what would you do differently to have a better journey, like a smoother, faster yeah. journey? Yeah, it's a good question. And I've been asked that a lot. I, I think, you know, I think on the real estate side, I probably wouldn't do anything differently. Okay. Uh, you know, on the personal side, on the personal side, I, I really don't think I was, you know, early on, I was well-rounded. I was so singularly focused on that, like financial freedom piece that it was at the detriment of the relationship with my wife. Like, we separated for six months when the kids were young. There was no, I wasn't reading books on personal development, right? Like, and, and, you know, and, you know, our relationship today is better than it's ever been, you know, 17, 17 years later. But a lot of that was stepping back and going, why am I doing what I'm doing? Like, what's actually imp- what's actually important to me? So I had read all these books on, you know, wealth and finance and real estate, but I never read a book on relationships. I yeah. never read a book on personal personal growth. And so, you know, I, I think I don't want to say I do anything differently because I do believe we're all where we're at because of decisions that we've made, good or bad. Mm-hmm. But I've sure. learned a lot on the on the way. And one of the biggest, you know, one of the biggest pieces is that you know, you can grow in all areas of life. And, and kind of like we had talked about earlier, I don't want to be an old, wealthy, unhappy person. I want to be, you know, old and wealthy and have great relationships with my kids and have great relationships my, with my wife. And, and be have, jacked. And, and, and be jacked. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you know, that health piece is, you know, is, is important for sure. But I think, I think early on, if just recognizing and reflecting what, what is truly what is truly important to me and why, why am I really doing that and not letting those other aspects of my life, you know, suffer and just finding, you know, opportunities to, to grow in all those areas. Cause at the end of the day, all those things are important and money is just money. Yeah. So realizing that your health, your relationships, your spirituality are really the things that are important. Your time freedom are really the things that are important and you don't have to sacrifice them on your road towards, towards wealth. Right. Actually like, the only, what you're going to use the wealth for is to fuel those things further. So why let them go, right? That's 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 great advice, man. The other question is, um, building relationships and networking has been one of the keys to you know to your success using creative creative seller financing and all of that. So what what is one piece of advice, man, that you could give to people when it comes to building um, relationships? Yeah, I think I think you know going in with the mindset of giving more than you're getting. You know, I. I don't, you know, like even going on these podcasts, I don't have an agenda. I'm not, I'm not selling anything. I don't have a book. I don't have a course. You know, I'm it's, it's for me, it's, it's a way to give back. If I can say one thing that makes an impact big or small in, in one of your listeners lives, like it's, it's, it's worth it, you know? And so, yeah, I, I think with relationship with relationships in particular, I, I think it's important, like, there's people that are going to come in your life. They may be acquaintances. They may maybe grow to become great friends and you may do a real estate deal with them. To me, I, I don't care one way or the other. I'm going to treat people like people. I'm going to treat them respectfully. And you know where that leads, I don't know, but I don't go into a relationship with some alternative motive of like trying to get, you know, trying to get something from them or trick them or making them like me just because I want to get a deal out of them. It's not like that. I'm going in to build a genuine real relationship and I'm trying to give more than I take. Awesome. Well, Gabriel, it's been awesome, man. I, uh, it's, it's been a pleasure talking to you and learning from you and getting to connect with you through this medium. Uh, thank you very much. If anyone wants to connect with you and, uh, you know, maybe look at all the content that you put out, you put out a lot and incredible content. Um, and they want to connect you with you. They want to build a relationship. They just want to know more about you, maybe. Um, then wh- where would be the best place for them to find you and connect? Yeah, Instagram is the best way at the real Gabriel Hamill. Got it. So we'll put that um, wherever this appears, man. It will appear everywhere. We're really good at that. So thank you very much, man. It's been a pleasure. And uh, I'll see you later. Yeah, thanks, Alex. I appreciate you having me on. Thank you for listening to the Modern Real Estate Investor Podcast. We want you to know that we love and appreciate you. And we are super grateful about being part of your journey of becoming a successful real estate entrepreneur and having it all. Please share this episode with a friend who you think will be impacted positively. 
Send it to someone who you know is interested in real estate and dreams of having it all and being the best they can be across all areas. And if you thought this episode was really valuable, share it on your social media as a post or a story. We have a special gift for all of those who contribute to the modern kings and queens movement. So for those of you who decided to share this episode and help us spread our message, send me a message letting me know on any social media platform at Alex Ramirez, the modern king. I have a special surprise for you. Thank you for watching and I'll see you later.